back at Rebel headquarters. Uh, now we've got a great guest for you guys, uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. She's running against Joseph Crowley uh, in New York. And this is a pivotal race because Crowley is the fourth uh, ranking member of the Democrats in the House. He is considered the congressman from Wall Street. And, and a lot of the Democrats brag about that, but I don't think that's necessarily a, a thing you should brag about. And, and Alexandria is a progressive challenger to him uh, from the Just Democrats. Uh, great to talk to you again. Awesome, yeah, I'm so happy to be here, Cenk. Thank you for having me on. Yeah, uh, no problem. And since we last talked, the Wall Street Journal has called you, quote, the most serious challenger in years to Crowley. Uh, so uh, there's no question that that uh, race is heating up. And as we've seen all across the country, once you've got progressives in primaries, all of a sudden, uh, those incumbents wind up becoming a little bit more progressive. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. Um, you know, a lot of people know that our challenge, and the media has even credited us um, with the fact that our challenge forced Joseph Crowley to co sponsor Medicare for All. Of course, that doesn't mean that he's going to continue supporting it once Democrats have a majority, but we were able to get that crucial co sponsorship. And what's also so great, Jenk, is that we were able to do this all with small dollar donations. And sometimes the, the chicken and egg is that. The media won't recognize you as a serious candidate unless you've raised millions of dollars or hundreds of thousands of dollars. And so people tried to raise that money just to be recognized by the media. We were able to kind of cut through without having to take uh, without having to take millions of dollars from special interests. We were able to get uh, outlets and publications like the Wall Street Journal to call us the most serious challenger um, in in over a decade. And so let's talk about one advantage that a progressive challenger like you has. And one most importantly that doesn't take corporate PAC money because um, the Democratic Party, sure they attacked Donald Trump in a couple of different ways and boy does he have it coming. But the one thing that, that, that I think he's most vulnerable about, uh, but that the Democrats almost never attack him on is corruption. Uh, the reality is he's serving his donors and that's why he lied about the tax plan and how he was going to raise taxes on the hedge fund guys, but instead did the opposite. Uh, he said, you know, he was going to protect Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, did the opposite, uh, all for tax cuts for the rich. So, an obvious line of attack that Crowley could do is look at his donors. That's why he's doing all the things that he's doing. Now, uh, is there a good reason why Crowley might not take up that line of attack? Of course it is, it's because Joseph Crowley shares the same pool of donors as Donald Trump. And this is the dirty little secret about certain Democratic candidates that take an insane amount of money from Wall Street, pharmaceutical companies, Wall Street lobbyists and so on. It's that they all eat from and they all drink from the same well. And so the reason that we can't hit Trump on the fact that he takes money from groups like Blackwater and luxury real estate developers is because Joseph Crowley takes the same amount of money. And in fact, the thing that's ironic about it is that the largest tax giveaway to corporations and the 1% before the GOP tax bill was the Bush tax cuts that Joseph Crowley in fact voted for. In addition, he voted for Puerto Rico to be sold over to Wall Street last year under the PROMESA Act. So this is a recurring problem and it is happening in both aspects of government. And what we need to do in 2018 is to elect progressive Democratic candidates that don't take corporate money. Because that is the only way that we are going to get true progressive policies that implement systemic changes that create prosperity for working and middle class Americans. So that I'm not at all surprised by. So. And they got a giant giveaway in the pass through portion of the tax. In fact, the last thing that people thought was the Bob Corker amendment actually helped Trump and Kushner, but it also helped Crowley's donors in New York. So to me, one of the, the telling things is, sure, the Democrats had an easy path to resistance because they're in the minority and the Republicans don't need their votes at all to pass those bills. But when they did in the Bush years, people like Dianne Feinstein and Crowley, when the chips were on the line and nobody was looking back then and they didn't have progressive primary challengers, they voted for those same tax cuts, didn't they? Mm -hmm. Absolutely, and we saw the same exact thing happen right after the GOP tax bill. Crowley himself went public and said, 
that they're even when Democrats are in power, they have no intention of um, repealing all of the GOP tax bill. Now, while there are certain aspects that we hope, you know, maybe be preserved in terms of increasing the individual family deduction and so on. At the end of the day, at the end of the day, we probably know that those give it, giveaways to real estate developers will very likely be protected by Joseph Crowley. So, Alexandria, right now they're having a debate in Congress and within the Democratic Party on whether they should insist on the Dream Act as part of the budget showdown. Some people that were in leadership were saying. Well, the budget is sacrosanct, we shouldn't touch that because that could affect their beloved markets. Um, and and so we should try to do the DREAM Act outside of that and trade it for border security. Uh, if you were in Congress and you defeat Crowley and you, a situation like this comes up, would you uh, risk a, a budget showdown uh, to make sure that the DREAM Act gets passed? Yes, and I, I want to explain very carefully why. I don't think that it's even 100% necessary to shut down the government, but the leverage that you get by by taking that courageous stance can force a negotiation before that happens. And in this specific case with DACA and the Dream Act, which has bipartisan support, you know, the thing that's so frustrating about the situation is that the whole reason Jeff Flake said and defended his vote for the GOP tax bill is because he said that he secured Republican votes for the Dream Act. And so this right here, the budget deal is our opportunity to take Flake to task and say, show us the votes that you got. These are Republicans saying that they are in public uh, in public approval of the Dream Act. So by forcing their hand, the same way that we should be doing with net neutrality, by the way, by forcing their hand uh, and taking a stance on the budget bill, we, we create a showdown where people show their chips, where the chips are down and rather they show their hand. And so I, I do believe that strategically, this is the right thing to do. We are not in a time right now where we can just wait for the Republican Congress to do the right thing. In fact, some of them may be even you know, caught up as we learn about this FBI investigation. We know that there's a lot of layers going on here and we need to force points of clarity. And I do believe that the budget is a perfect time to be doing that. It's not reckless if we force, if we're, it's not reckless if we're reasonable about the things that we force a discussion on. And I believe that this is one, it has bipartisan support with Senate, Senate members in particular and, and Republican Senate members at that going public saying that they would support the Dream Act. Yeah, I, I know for corporate Democrats, anything that might touch their donors for a second, they will call reckless. Mm -hmm. Right? Maybe it's reckless for them because that's what their campaigns depend on, uh, but not for the people. So um, I want to touch on on the campaign. Uh, so you apparently have a voter suppression issue in New York. Uh, we've talked a little bit about this in the past, but not the not the latest twist in this saga. Uh, Democrats complain about voter suppression uh, throughout the country as well. They should. It's a horrific issue. Uh, but for it to be applied to Democrats in the very blue state of New York is particularly maddening. Uh, what's the latest twist here? Yeah, absolutely. So the thing about New York and the common misconception that New York is a progressive state comes from the fact that Democrats have an iron grip over the access to the ballot and access to who is on the ballot in particular. Um, as many people may know, New York had the second lowest voter primary turnout in 2016, second only to Louisiana. And um, on the other side of that, there's also control over who can get access to the ballot. So what Ocasio 2018 and what our campaign's next big initiative is, is to get access to the ballot. Now, Crowley's not only the chairman of the Queens Democratic Party, I mean, not only the congressman, but he He's the chairman of the Queens Democratic Party, which means that he not only controls things on a federal level, but he controls who is on the local level and who's running for office on the local level. And in order for us to get on the ballot, we're going to have to probably turn in around 10,000 signatures in order to, to even run for office to begin with, because the moment a regular person decides that they want to run for office, whether it's for city council or state assembly or Congress. Um, they turn in their signatures and in the borough of Queens on the day that you turn in your signatures, Joseph Crowley will send his lawyers to challenge you in court. This is a system that is designed to keep working people uh, uh, 
working people uh, not running for office. It's a, just a system designed and tactics that he uses to keep um, progressive candidates from running for office in the borough of Queens and frankly in New York City in general. And uh, this type of control over who can even run for office in the first place has no business in the hands of Joseph Crowley. People who run for office are beholden to voters and voters should be the one who determines who runs, who is able to run. And so um, this is this is this also has wide implications on real estate and the cost of living on a local level because he takes um, his real estate developer money, he controls who runs for office. He had a very strong hand, as many people know, in determining who the city council speaker was, who, by the way, takes regular meetings with real estate lobbyists. And um, he handpicks the citywide government in addition to federal uh, congressional leadership. So this is a very uh, intricate web here of special interests. But what we need uh, people to understand is that the only way we win this thing is by having volunteers go out, talk to their neighbors and collect signatures to help us get on the ballot in March. So that's people power. And uh, if you uh, are in the area and you wanna help uh, and make sure that people have a choice, uh, e e even if you know, you're not sure which way they're gonna vote, at least give them the opportunity and the choice. Uh, so uh, go to the description box on YouTube and comment section on Facebook and then I'll have a link for that you can just click on to volunteer to get those signatures. All right, so last issue, you brought it up uh, one more time, cost of living in New York. I, I know Manhattan's completely out of control, but um, you know, uh, I'm not sure that I knew how bad it was in your uh, district. So tell us about that and why you think those, does do the real estate developer there? Uh, does that issue then affect the cost of living, and how does all this play out? Absolutely, absolutely. So uh, for those who don't know, my my district, New York 14, is half in the Bronx half in Queens and also contains Rikers Island. It's a very working class district. The median income floats around $47,000 per year. And what we saw in the Throgs Neck and East Bronx area, which is the area that's in our district, is that foreclosures have gone up 145% in the borough of Queens, in this area of Queens. Uh, people are starting to foreclose on their homes and these foreclosures get scooped up by luxury real estate developers. And when they have the favor of um, local elected officials, this turns into a total raising of the area communities. People who have been there for generations are now forced to move elsewhere. And it is a total uprooting of the actual community that exists in New York 14. It is a huge problem. Additionally, um, in foreclosures in Queens, foreclosures in, in Queens get sent to the surrogates court. And so to date, Joseph Crowley has kind of been running a scheme where he appoints his political friends to the surrogates court, and then they are able to actually profit off of every single foreclosure that goes to that court. So it is it is an extreme process of entrenched machine politics that profits off of this the, the despair in our district. And we're here to say no more. We're here to say that public officials have to 100% put the working families in their district first, not before donors, not before the wealthy, not before anybody else. Working families need to come first in American policy and in local politics. And that starts with fighting for equitable access to health care, housing, and uh, food. Wouldn't it be amazing if uh, you had a congressperson that actually uh, fought for you and for citizens as opposed to the powerful? Uh, let us whisper of a dream. <laughs> okay, uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez is clearly running to be that person. Uh, and again, all the links to her websites, uh, et cetera, are in the description box. Thank you so much for joining us, Alexandria, and good luck on the race. Thank you so much, Jenk. I really appreciate it. No problem.